Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 37th annual Social Work Day at the UN. And happy World Social Work Day. We're so glad to have all of you here with us. We have um, close to 1,900 people coming into this event this afternoon, which is fabulous. This is the first time that we've actually been able to hold Social Work Day at the UN on World Social Work Day. And it's only possible because we're doing this event remotely. With all events that have been held remotely over this year, we also have been able to allow for more access. So that's why uh, hopefully by the time we'll get done, there'll be close to 1900 people in this room with us. Our planning committee has worked very hard to bring you a wonderful program and speakers today. As you will see from the program, we will be asking our panelists some specific questions. And then if we have time, we'll, there'll be an opportunity for our audience to ask a few questions. Again, thank you for attending today. And I'm going to turn the mic now over to Dr. Darla Coffey, President of the Council on Social Work Education. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm going to ask Angela McLean to also join me. Um, the two of us are going to be bringing greetings. Um, so first, I just want to thank Drs. Mama and Gatanio Gable for co-chairing um, the planning committee for this fabulous event. And I know that there were a number of um, committee members as well representing the three I's, IA, SSW, IFSW, and ICSW. So I want to thank Hannah Burke, Shanae Osborne, Dr. Congress, Drs. Davis, and Dr. Sergey Zelenev. Um, for all of your good work. We're super excited to be here. I send you, bring greetings from the Council on Social Work Education. Um, the, Dr. Sandra Starks, who is the chair of the CSW Board of Directors, um, extends her greetings as well as all members of the Board of Directors. The 36 staff of CSWE were a lean but mean group of staff and the over 800 or nearly 900 programs now of accredited social work in the US Guam and Puerto Rico. So we're thrilled about this. It's one of my favorite times of year. I love March. It's an appropriate love fest for social workers. So I'm hoping that everybody feels that love for sure. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things, just in case you don't know, most people think about CSWE as being about accreditation first and foremost, and the only thing, but we do lots of other things. And we've been moving our programs um, more into the direction of making sure that we prepare all social work practitioners for to, to be international and global in their perspectives, whether they're actually going overseas and practicing internationally or recognizing that the global is very much now local in terms of our own communities. So I represent all of the schools of social work on the board of directors of the International Association of Schools of Social Work. And our commitment to internationalization shows up in our governance structure. We have a commission on global social work education. It's got two councils, one on global social issues and one on global learning and practice. We actually were very, very fortunate that Dr. Catherine Kendall um, put her money where her, her commitments were in terms of social work. And I wanted to, oh, I'm sorry. I've got too many things going on. So anyway, I wanted to, we have a fabulous Kendall Institute that supports internationalizing the social work education curriculum um, across all of our programs. And of course it shows up in our educational policy and accreditation standards. So that's just a little snippet of what we do in the international space. Dr. McLean, would you like to give us greetings from NASW? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Coffey. I, I would, um, I, I remember uh, how disappointed I was last year when we weren't able to gather at the UN um, in New York. So I'm, I'm so glad we're able to do this virtually uh, this year because it's always an important time of the year to, to kind of pause from our busy, busy schedules. We always have so much going on, but to just kind of pause for one day across the globe and uh, give social workers a shout out and a thanks for all the good work that social workers do. And uh, so really on behalf of the, the National Association of Social Workers, our staff, 
our board and our more than 100,000 members. I just want to say welcome to the um, Social Work Day at the United Nations. Uh, and I hope everyone today and the rest of this week uh, really take pride and joy in the work that you do as a social worker. And that um, whether you're in micro practice, meso practice, um, or micro, meso, macro, I, sometimes I get those confused because it's 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 all integrated, and we all should feel like we we can we all do work at all those different levels. And I know we've got social work educators, researchers, practitioners, advocates. Uh, you know all the work that we do in all those different fields of practice we do. It, it's all important. Uh, social work is essential. You know, we, we've been learning through the pandemic. Uh, and some folks say we've had multiple pandemics at the same time. But we've been learning the crucial role of social workers and the, that, uh, that their society values us more than we think sometimes. And that particularly during uh, this time, this day, this week, we can all pat ourselves on the back and be thankful that, that we collectively do a terrific job uh, and you know, in keeping with the theme for for World Social Work Day, you know, when we are stronger when we stand together, and there's all kind of ways we can stand together. You know, coming together like this, you know, uh, recognizing the good work that we do, and 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 collaborating and partnering on on various things. So, on behalf of NESW, um, I want to say welcome. And uh, thanks to all the presenters and the organizers for pulling together an event where we can all pause and, and uh, just take some time to reflect and, and to look forward. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Darla. Thank you, Angelo. Robin, back to you. Thank you. There will be two short videos coming on now for welcomes from uh, our ICSW president and IFSW president. First of all, I would like to welcome all the participants for attending the Social Work Day at the United Nations today. Today's session will be a very important opportunity for our organizations to discuss responses to various social problems emerged in the era of COVID-19. Among various social problems we are facing now, the most prominent issue is the rising inequality problem. Social polarization will intensify in the coming months due to the economic recession caused by COVID-19 and we will face a more unequal society than ever before. It is our duty to address those social problems and advocate as an international social welfare society. However, due to the outbreak of COVID-19, it makes us difficult to interact in person between the international social welfare experts all around the world. Accordingly, ICSW intends to hold several online seminars this year to create a place where everyone can interact and discuss important issues emerged in the social welfare sector. To start with, the role of ICTs for social inclusion and social welfare is the theme for our first seminar in May. The objective of the seminar is to address some key social welfare problems generated in the process of digitalization of our societies in greater depth. As COVID-19 affects nutritional and poverty status of the most vulnerable population groups. Second seminar in October will address food insecurity in Africa, strategies for ensuring child-sensitive social protection. Last seminar will be conducted in November with a the theme of preparing for the post-COVID-19 era towards universal 
social protection. This seminar will especially cover all three pillars, the state, market, and civil society for addressing social problems that are too complex for the state alone to solve. It will be an opportunity to share national experiences, challenges for achieving universal social protection systems. I hope today's event will be our first opportunity to discuss the responses and strategies we all really need in the era of COVID-19. I also look forward to more opportunities to discuss together in cooperation and your interest for ICSW International Seminars this year. Thank you. Estimados colegas, junto con los organizadores de este importante evento, es un gran placer darles la bienvenida al evento de trabajo social en las Naciones Unidas, de New York. El tema Respuestas a COVID, Estar Juntos nos hace más fuerte, es el mensaje clave, un mensaje que contiene el gran aprendizaje global de esta época de pandemia mundial. La unidad hace la fuerza porque sabemos que nadie se salva solo. Tanto los trabajadores sociales como todos los organismos que han cooperado y los trabajadores sanitarios pueden estar orgullosos de haber hecho realidad este mensaje desde el principio de esta crisis. En primera línea, los trabajadores rompieron las fronteras políticas que dividen la salud de los servicios sociales y se tendieron la mano para poner en marcha políticas de asistencia y servicios adecuados que apoyen a la población en su seguridad y protección social. Incluso en las últimas semanas, la FITS colaboró con sus equivalentes mundiales en medicina, enfermería y todo el personal sanitario para unir fuerzas y abogar por un acceso equitativo a las vacunas en todo el mundo. La colaboración no solo significó articular acciones, sino que también implicó la importancia de no solo ver el problema y las posibles soluciones desde un punto de vista médico, sino también desde una mirada y abordaje social. Trabajamos en la necesidad de que las comunidades y las poblaciones sean consideradas como protagonistas y principales actores para abordar el problema, afrontar la crisis y las condiciones que la provocan. Tenemos un largo camino por recorrer, por supuesto. Hay que abordar las desigualdades sociales estructurales, los factores políticos, económicos y sociales desencadenantes de la pobreza y el cambio climático que han conducido a esta pandemia y a esta crisis global sin precedentes. Hay que abordar la depresión económica que ya ha empujado a 70 millones de personas a la pobreza y hay que hacer frente a la mala gestión de muchos gobiernos. Sin embargo, una de las herramientas que tenemos para afrontar esta crisis reside precisamente en el tema de este evento, estar juntos, trabajar colaborativamente y solidariamente. Porque si bien sabemos, eh, sin un trabajo articulado no es posible. Nadie se salva solo. Al ampliar nuestras alianzas, como hoy, al invitar a una serie de voces expertas en el panel e identificar líderes comunitarios, nacionales y globales en colaboración, estamos sembrando las semillas de una nueva forma de trabajar. Estamos reconociendo el poder potencial de las comunidades, los grupos de interés y las poblaciones involucradas con el objetivo de trabajar todos juntos. Por lo tanto, en nombre de las 143 Asociaciones Nacionales de Trabajo Social de la FITS, aplaudimos a las organizaciones de este evento y damos las gracias a los ponentes invitados y animamos a los participantes a llevar estos aprendizajes a sus propias comunidades. Toda la fuerza a las asociaciones, toda la fuerza al trabajo social y de nuevo, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. We are now going to turn to Dr. Vishante Supal to give us an understanding of Ubuntu 
The concept of Ubuntu is key to Global Social Work Day and to the global agenda. Dr. Supal, an awardee of three honorary degree, doctoral degrees from Chile, Norway, and Sweden, is a globally recognized human rights scholar, international speaker, and activist. She chaired the following committees on behalf of IASSW, the Global Standards for Social Work Education and Training, the Global Social Work Definition, and the Global Social Work Statement of Ethical Principles. She is an Emeritus Professor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and a Professor at the University of Stravanger, Norway. She recently completed her memoir titled The Arc of Our Paths, Growing into Wholeness. Dr. Supal, please, welcome to Social Work Day and please take the floor. Thank you so much, Robin. Friends and colleagues across the globe, namaste. Ubuntu is an Afrocentric philosophical worldview that embraces humanism and humanistic ethics. It has been popularized by great souls like Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu who demonstrated in very tangible ways how love, care, compassion, kindness, and forgiveness can be transformed into broad socio-political forces. While Ubuntu is primarily associated with South Africa, it has gained global appeal. But Ubuntu exists in many languages and cultures, such as Bomoto in Congo, Gimuntu in Angola, Boto in Botswana, Umuntu in Malawi and Uganda, Bumuntu in Tanzania, and Hunu amongst the Shona majority of Zimbabwe. These concepts also exist in non-African languages and philosophies across the world. If not with the exact concepts, certainly the idea of being for the other and service above self, as theorists such as Emmanuel Levinas and Zygmunt Bauman call for. Ubuntu asserts, I am because we are. It embraces a we-centeredness where we accord the unique other that priority that we assign to the self. To be responsible means to make oneself available in service of the other in such a way that one, one's own life is intrinsically linked with that of others. Ubuntu recognizes the interdependencies amongst us as human beings, between us and all other species, and between people and the environment. COVID-19 is teaching us that if we do not take care of all of nature, nature would take care of itself. The 2020 UNDP Human Development Report draws the link between the unleashing of viruses and the pressures that we put on the earth. Our technological advances are a double-edged sword in terms of both human relationships and the earth. The report says, humans have achieved incredible things, but we have taken the earth to the brink. Climate change, rupturing inequalities, record numbers of, pe of people forced from their homes by conflict and crises. These are the results of societies that value what they measure instead of measuring what they value. This really accords with our critiques of neoliberal capitalism, new public management, and science of the logical positivist tradition. The carbon and material footprint of the people who have more denies opportunities for those who have less. As we do know, the fissures of the social fault lines based on social criteria such as race, class, gender, disability, sexuality, language, and nationality run very, very deep. Planetary imbalances and social imbalances exacerbate each other. And, it, and this is being laid bare by COVID-19. Ubuntu is more than an abstract philosophical ideal. Sorry. It calls for pro-social values and attitudes and thoughts to be made manifest in acts of solidarity at local, national, regional, and global levels. 
it does the world no good if some people can be vaccinated against COVID-19 and others can't. Ubuntu means challenging and undoing structural sources of privilege and power and of disadvantage, violence, exclusion, and oppression. Ubuntu is only one of a range of ideals of the Afrocentric paradigm. Holding the ideal of Ubuntu means that we open ourselves to the other principles of Afrocentricity. It me means that we advocate for sociopolitical and economic governance systems that expand people's choices, freedoms, opportunities, capabilities, and their ability to participate in decision-making so that they can live, lead lives that they value. Where one lives and who one lives, who is, should not determine whether one lives or dies. Egalitarianism can be achieved by humanism, not a reductionist measure of GBT, GDP. It asks that we think outside of the strictures of neoliberalism. Ubuntu, like Asian spiritualities, says, my soul honors your soul. I honor the place in you where the entire universe resides. I honor the light, love, truth, beauty, and peace within you because it is also in me. In sharing these things, we are united. We are the same. We are one. In Ubuntu, we acknowledge that we hold in ourselves our extraordinariness and the divine. It recognizes the embodied self and the vulnerability of all of humanity. It holds the sublime values of coexistence, equality, solidarity, peace, love, justice, and the oneness of humanity. While we advocate for structural changes to ensure that our Ubuntu ideals are realized, and we clamor for the world to change. Let us begin with ourselves. I end with a Sanskrit mantra that says, Loka Samastha Sukino Bhavantu. That is, may all beings everywhere be happy and free. And may the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Supal, for that lovely um, and inspirational description of Ubuntu and how that will lead us through our program today. We're very pleased now to be able to start our panel discussion, and I would like to invite Laurel Patterson to join us as she's the first speaker. Laurel is the head of SDG integration at UNDP, it's Global Policy Network. Uh, she was previously the Senior Global Policy Advisor, leading on integrated policy development for SDG implementation in fragile and conflict-affected settings. She was also Deputy Director of the UN System Affairs Group, leading on UN reform, and Deputy Director of the Partnerships Group in UNDP's Bureau for External Relations and Advocacy. Laura, we're very happy to have you with us today, and I would invite you to take the floor now for your presentation. Thank you so much, Robin. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, colleagues and friends, wherever you are. Thank you so much for having us. And, and, and I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity to celebrate social work, which has always been so important, but I think it's taken on new dimensions of, of criticality and urgency uh, in light of the COVID pandemic. And I was reflecting back over the weekend on social work itself and, and what this brings in. I, I found this uh, reflection on why social work is important in a blog that was re written recently. And it said, social work is important because the people of the world and their well being and their welfare is important. Social workers bridge the gap between our people and policies, between social relationships, and even between people and their personal issues. And this is, this is so critical, not only in recovering from COVID, but creating development pathways that are sustainable and equitable. And I'm really delighted to join you today with Christina, with Paul and with Judith, all change makers and leaders uh, in their work for, for this important discussion. Where this really echoes, echoes with our work is that of course the 2030 agenda is itself a systems agenda. 
what's most important about the agenda and particularly for the work that I do at UNDP on SDG integration is, is acting as a bridge, is understanding what those bridges are, how issues are interconnected and asking ourselves fundamental questions on what are those entry points that can impact wider systems. I think something that we're all really focused on these days through COVID and in this important decade ahead is how do systems change? What does that mean? We know that we were off track before COVID, all of our data and analytics, and I'll get into that next, would tell us exactly that. So it's not more of what we were doing before. And I think one of the risks that we run uh, in recovering from COVID is, is accelerating as if it was in itself a direction. What I think we risk in doing that is tinkering at the edges of status quo uh, and looking to fix what's broken in system rather than radically reimagining. And unless we're going to radically reimagine the future, we won't meet that ambition of the 2030 agenda. And we won't be able to live in harmony with each other and with our planet in the way that we need to not only for our generation, but for future generations. So this is a, an issue that we're, we're really focused on at UNDP. At UNDP, we lead the socioeconomic response uh, of the UN system to COVID recovery. We've supported more than 130 countries in assessing their, the impact of COVID on their countries and developing response plans with them. And that's, of course, a collaboration across the rest of the UN system. But we're doing that in a way because what we want to do is we want to shift away from single point or, or linear solutions. And we're moving towards using data and analytics to be able to help create portfolios of options, sets of alternative pathways that countries, communities, and individuals can start to interrogate and identify what could be most effective in their context. So what I want to focus on in my intervention here is really around leaving no one behind, how we get to this granular local level of understanding issues and challenges that people are feeling, and how can data and analytics be something that supports, uh, that, supports that, that, uh, that process. We're going to talk a little bit in inequalities in, in the Q&A that's going to follow, but I, I want to put up front, not only have we seen inequalities exacerbated through COVID, uh, but of course, even in the recovery from COVID, we're seeing significant inequalities. So the Economist Intelligence Unit recently estimated that 85 countries won't have access to vaccines until 2023. So what does this mean for the trajectories of their countries based on not only those previous conditions and challenges that they were facing, but the way that COVID has impacted them specifically? In terms of recovery itself, high income countries have been able to allocate the equivalent of 20% of GDP to recovery. And in low income countries that sits at 2%. We're also needing to be cognizant of the fact that the impact of COVID is continuing to evolve. So 21 countries in Africa currently have fatality rates that are above the global average. And this relates in good part to a lack of access to facilities, uh, basic healthcare facilities and treatment. So marginalized communities for the, for, for the discussion we're having here today as well too, it shouldn't be something as understood as existing in other countries far away. As you all know very well, marginalized communities in higher income countries are not spared from, from the differentiated impact of COVID. And a recent CDC report showed that gay, lesbian, and bisexual people experience stigma that increases their vulnerability to in illness, and it leads to higher COVID risk overall. So what I wanna do is just share a couple of top line statistics with you and then get underneath them just a little bit uh, to give you a sense of, of the work that we're doing. And we would certainly love to have all of you involved in it. So first is in terms of COVID impact on poverty. We have seen for the first time in 20 years that the number of people living in poverty is expected to rise due to the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, later on about a study that we've done uh, where we've created a set of future scenarios to try to understand how COVID could impact to 2030 and to 2050. And in the high damage scenario, so worst case, but very, far from impossible, but in a high damage scenario, more than a billion people would be in poverty by 2030. And 250 million, a quarter billion of those people would be in poverty as a direct result of the pandemic. That means that the poverty that they are being pushed into now will prevail for the next 10 years. And of course that in itself is gonna create new implications, which we need to be ready to navigate and support countries in their policy choices to address. Similarly for education, 
168 million children were out of school as a result of school closures over COVID. Now, while those children were at home, not all children had access to quality education, particularly for basic literacy and numeracy. 250 million children were already out of school before the pandemic. And of those 168 children at home, there's a concern that a significant number won't return. And again, the way that we experience that now, the way that will play out over the years ahead is really important for us uh, to consider and to understand. And again, we can use data analytics, we need to use a lot more, but these are things that can help us understand that impact. The third point that I wanted to make just in terms of overall data points is on gender-based violence and share a recent quote from the Secretary General who said that peace is not the absence of war and that many women under COVID lockdown face violence where they should be safest, which is at home. It makes it even harder for us to understand, to have the information of how women are being affected when this violence is playing out at home in the context of lockdowns. But we know that it's been significant. We know that it's been especially significant in fragile countries where data uh, gathering is limited, uh, but a number of studies have put forward just how devastating this has been for women already left behind, already in the most vulnerable conditions. We've seen even the United States that 3 billion women have dropped out of the labor force as a result of COVID. What does that mean for those sustainable and equitable pathways that are so essential for us to input and put into place now for the decade ahead? So a couple of things that we're doing at UNDP. One, we have put a tremendous effort in something that we've called the COVID-19 Data Futures Platform. And the idea here is to think and use and harness the potential of data and new technology different. We're building a set of scenarios. We're building a set of future studies that you can interact with. And all of you can go there today uh, and check this out. You can write to us at data.undp.org, data at undp.org. And we would really be very happy to continue the discussion. What we're trying to do is create spaces where we can use data to think through futures options and create those options in such a way that they are best positioned to influence decision makers and change makers across the board so that we get back on track. We exceed where we would have been before COVID. Three quick examples. The first is on data storytelling, where we're partnering with a firm called Flow Immersive, and we're creating interactive visualizations to understand, in this case, an ongoing initiative with Bangladesh and the country and our offices there to take a look at social protection coverage, where that's changing, how it's evolving as people are coming into or out of the country, and what it would mean financially to be able to ensure that there's a temporary basic income uh, for most vulnerable populations, point number one. The second is advanced analytics, which we're supporting. All of this is, again, anchored on this data futures platform to create a global dashboard with WHO and with Oxford to be able to track vaccine prices and supply. Right now, you can find a lot of information on COVID you can, and, and, and its impact. You can find it in a lot of different places. Very difficult to see and understand in one place the way that pricing and supply is playing out and so critical for a, an equitable recovery from COVID. And what we're doing is we're supporting countries with hyper-local analysis, bringing together all different types of data sources into one space to allow decision makers to ask themselves a series of questions of how they could distribute a vaccine, knowing that that, that distribution is likely to be uh, slow. Maybe there'll be a certain supply that will come in and then there'll be a, a certain time lapse before another. So how do we navigate all of this uncertainties with our countries? And what we're able to do with these hyper-local analytics is bring together information that's focused on existing vulnerabilities, health exposure risk, previous vaccine patterns, which are a good indication of populations that could be left behind, health infrastructure, health facilities, road infrastructure and electricity, which is so critical for cold supply chain, bring this into one place so that we can drive an equitable recovery from COVID in country at local level. One other variable, which I would mention uh, in that model, which might be interesting for this audience, is we're able to zoom in the hyperlocal allows us to zoom into one square kilometer and also allows us to look at wealth inequalities in neighborhoods because access is also uh, impacted by affordability. So how do we understand the way uh, that people are able to access those vaccines at, at, uh, at local, at community and neighborhood levels? And the last point that I, I want to end with is a, a study which I had mentioned at the start where we're modeling potential futures. This is all data driven, potential futures of the way that COVID could impact. And we've modeled a couple. 
and we certainly plan on, on modeling many more. But what you'll see in this space of our work is that we've been able, not only in that high damage, I started with worse so that I could end with something better, uh, where we see a billion people in poverty by 2030, but we created a scenario where we said, what would it take to recover better? But like literally, practically, what would those policy choices be? What would it look like? And we created uh, a scenario which we've called the SDG push. It has 48 different parameters and you can, you can go and, and we can get into those details later if there's time. But it actually puts us globally on a, on a development trajectory ahead of where we would have been without COVID. And our point is not to say now we can sort of uh, celebrate and everything will, will be fine. It will be incredibly difficult to navigate and all contexts will be different for the way that those kinds of choices will play out. But it's to say that it's possible. It's ambitious, but it's possible. And we wanna put into this space right now the potential to use the disruption of COVID, see this as an opportunity for change, but rather than that rhetoric, that narrative, which is important, but leaves us wondering how, put the data and analytics behind that sentiment so that we can really start to craft policy choices that could respond uh, to what it would take to accelerate progress in the, in the decade ahead. My, my last point would just be to echo Vishanti and what she had mentioned in, in her statement, which was let us start with ourselves. So another pillar of our work on SDG integration is systems transformation that situates the self in systems. And our recent human development report, if you haven't read it, I would strongly encourage it on human development in the Anthropocene, has a whole section on acting for change. It's about the kinds of incentives that can drive change very, very practically. It's about nature-based solutions so that we prevent these kinds of situations and pandemics from happening in the future. But it's about shifting social norms, which strikes me as particularly relevant for the group here today. How do we bridge the gap between an espoused belief and our collective action? What would it take for us to start to move towards the results collectively that we want to see? And I hope that uh, this has given you some insights in the way that we want to contribute uh, to that at UNDP. We would certainly welcome uh, uh, engagement on the Data Futures platform and in some of the other work that we're doing. And I will leave it to my other panelists for more details and information. Thank you so much, Robin, and, and thank you all. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sergei Zelenev, and I'm special representative of the International Council on Social Welfare uh, to the United Nations. Greetings to all. I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Christina Berin, who represents International Labour Office, and Christina joins us from Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, she, uh, Christina worked, uh, uh, works at the Social Protection Department of the International Labour Organization, where she is a head of the Social Policy Unit. Christina is a well-known scholar uh, and author of many publications on social protection issues and is one of the lead authors of the ILO flagship publication, World Social Protection Report. Her current focus uh, is on the extension of social protection in low and middle income countries, but she also has worked and published on a wide range of issues including various aspects of social security, income distribution, poverty alleviation, and the future of work. Uh, she worked not only at the ILO headquarters, but also at the ILO regional office for the Arab states uh, in Beirut, Lebanon, on social security issues. Uh, and she also has teaching experience, because Christina, she worked at the University of Constance in her native Germany. Welcome, Christina. And please uh, uh, introduce us to the work of the ILO on this very important direction. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sergey, and uh, thank you very much for um, for the opportunity to be be with you. And really, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is just joining us um, here on this on this important day. And it is really an enormous honor and pleasure to be. Uh, here with you uh, for Social Work Day at the at the UN, and I must say I've taken part in several events for the Social Work Days, but it has never been so global and never with so many participants. So it's really an enormous um, pleasure and 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 a nice opportunity to be here with with you. 
And uh, I would like to zoom in, and I think this complements well um, the presentation that uh, Laurel um, has given. I would like to zoom in a bit more specifically on, on social protection and explain you also a bit what the, what the ILO um, is doing. And indeed, I think the, the event and uh, this question could not be more timely. The COVID pandemic has really had dramatic consequences of people's health, their jobs, their livelihoods and income, as we have just heard from, from Laura. And the crisis has ex exposed uh, more specifically and in a very painful way, the vulnerability of those who do not enjoy adequate social protection coverage. And this is certainly true in poorer countries, but even in rich countries, we have seen the serious consequences of gaps in social protection. So like under a magnifying glass, the pandemic has drawn our attention to the serious consequences of people not being able to rely on social protection for access to healthcare and income security. And we have seen now with the crisis um, that countries which have had social protection systems in place, um, they were able to mobilize these systems and scale up support and reach those in urgent need um, of income support, of sickness benefits, uh, of healthcare. So this was really very essential in, in, the, in the crisis. But even those countries, they had to plug um, coverage gaps and adequate gaps. But for countries that do not yet have um, a solid social protection systems in place. Um, for them, it was even more, more difficult. They had to recur to emergency responses and really start uh, reacting from, from scratch. And so I think one of the lessons that we can draw from the, from the crisis and in order to address the root causes of vulnerability is really help and support countries in building up uh, their social protection systems and especially their social protection floors. And social protection floors, and this is also um, a concept which is um, reflected by an, in an ILO recommendation, which was adopted in 2012, but is also reflected in the SDGs. This is really about a guarantee that um, ensures that everyone has access to at least a basic level of income security and has access to healthcare as really as a minimum but also the aspiration is, of course, um, to go further on, on that. And um, where we are now, I mean, I think we are currently really as an, at an important crossroads. So the question is, are we going to hear the wake up call provided by the crisis and reinforce social protection systems and make them fit for the, for the future? Um, can we ensure that they can guarantee universal, adequate and comprehensive protection for all that is adapted to the changing world of work and based on a sustainable and equitable financing framework? Um, or is the world rather drifting towards a more kind of a low road scenario driven by austerity policies, um, considering that many countries are facing huge fiscal challenges? at the moment where access to social protection is limited to a very meager safety net and where gaps in labor and social protection continue to undermine people's welfare. Where the limited risk sharing and redistribution and weak labor market institutions and social protection systems contribute to ever increasing inequalities. So I think now is really the time to choose and uh, the, the ILO, the Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work, which was adopted in June 2019, even before the crisis. But I think it's highly relevant um, to provide a clear roadmap towards a human-centered uh, future of work and future of life in, in more general terms that really has um, human rights and dignity and decent work at, at this, its core. Um, let me just quickly mention three policy priorities, and I'm mindful of the time, so I'll be, I'll be very quick. The first one is really accelerating the extension of social protection to those who are not yet sufficiently covered, including those in the, in the informal economy. And we know that this is possible, and uh, which is particularly important to do that in a gender responsive and inclusive way, and ensuring in particular that those who are um, left behind are, in, uh, are included in those, in those efforts. 
Um, secondly, it's really about strengthening social protection systems with a, a bigger picture in mind. So promoting universal social protection that is rights-based in line with human rights and international social security standards and anchored in national legislation. So temporary safety nets are definitely not enough. People need a solid social protection floor to walk on and to dance on. And this is not a one size fits all approach. This is really about countries designing their own social protection floors and where necessary with the, with the um, support of the international community. And thirdly, um, it is really critical to ensure sufficient investment in universal social protection systems so that people can really realize their right to social security and that communities and societies can be, can be more resilient. And um, so I think now it's really time to capture the momentum engendered by the, by the current crisis, to urgently close the gaps in social protection systems and to build universal social protection systems with very strong social protection floors. And social workers have a very important role to play in this. And your role cannot be overest cannot be underestimated, sorry. And with that, I would like to wish you a very happy social work day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for your uh, presentation. And thank you for uh, this uh, inspiring statement. Um, uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, 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 Paul Ladd, who is a director of the United Nations uh, Research Institute for Social Development. Uh, and uh, uh, this demanding position uh, requires combination of scholarship and managerial skills, of course. Uh, Paul uh, has been director of UNRIST uh, uh, since uh, October 2015. Uh, before taking up this position, he had been at the United Nations Development uh, Program uh, and uh, uh, where, as a director of the team, uh, he supported uh, consultations and technical inputs for the 2030 uh, development agenda. Uh, Paul also provided support to the office uh, of the, uh, under sec uh, to the UN Secretary General on the financial and the economic uh, um, crisis and engagement with the uh, G20. Uh, before joining the UN, uh, Paul Led work, was a policy advisor uh, on international development uh, to the, uh, United, in the United Kingdom Treasury. Uh, also, he worked as a chief economist uh, and acting head of policy uh, with the UK, UK charity, Christian Aid, before he joined the UN. Uh, I would like also to underscore that Paul is also an international Geneva gender champion. He has committed to ensuring that relevant gender concerns uh, features in every piece of published unreased research, while gender balance is an integral part of the Institute. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, uh, Sergei. And, uh... Hello to the almost 800 people that are joining us uh, for this event. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to talk to you. Um, I'm personally very happy to join you today to celebrate uh, World Social Work Day. Uh, UNRIS, the organization for which I'm the director, has co-hosted the celebration of World Social Work Day in Geneva since 2017, and we'll be having our two-day event starting, starting tomorrow. Um, and that's co-sponsored by uh, local schools of social work in Geneva and Freiburg, and also the International Federation of Social Workers and IASSW. Um, before I talk about unrest and, and COVID, I just wanted to say a few words about social work and the SDGs. So as you've heard from uh, Vishanti, the framing of this year's celebration of World Social Work Day is Ubuntu. I am because we are, which speaks strongly to community and solidarity. For the 2030 agenda and the goals that underpin it, that principle of solidarity is expressed clearly in the overarching commitment to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest away first. Now, social work clearly differs from context to context, but it's people-centered, it's based in communities, and it's about providing support to people who are facing social deprivation or hardship 
or personal or family challenges. This means support for children, for older persons, for women, for the homeless, for asylum seekers and migrants, every person in the community. For me, and this is the reason I think UNRIST is so proud of co-hosting uh, World Social Work Day in uh, Geneva, social work is the leave no one behind profession, or rather social workers are the leave no one behind professionals. And that makes social work incredibly important to the realization of the vision contained in the 2030 um, agenda. Now, uh, at UNRIST, we're a, a research institute based in the UN. We're a policy-oriented research institute that aims to provide the best evidence and advice to governments around the world, but also our counterparts in the UN system. One of our key characteristics is our autonomy, which means that we don't have member states on our board telling us what we can research or not. And I want to come back to that because I think a lot of the fundamentals about positive change are around politics. They're often not about the policy choices which we've had on the table for the last 20 years. They're very much about how you build coalitions for change to understand the incentives and to break through the political deadlocks that prevent um, progress. Now in UNRIS, we have four research programs, one on transformative social policy, one on gender justice and development, one on environmental and climate justice, and one on alternative economies for transformation. And these are long running programs that we uh, uh, prepare with our counterparts in research uh, networks based all around the world. We're very proud of our uh, balanced network of uh, academics and civil society practitioners from different regions of the world, completely balanced between the North and the South and balanced by gender. And we place a lot of effort and time into the co-production of methodologies, of research projects, and of the knowledge that we create um, together. Most of that research takes a long time. So we like to work on issues that are on the horizon. Uh, apologies for the uh, church in the background. Uh, that are on the horizon so that we can prepare the evidence in advance of when it's needed. But clearly for COVID-19, there was an imperative of speed. And so what we did in UNRIST is we tapped into our global research network so that we could bring information to the table that was, that was important then. Uh, we launched a survey in our network which was focused on vulnerable groups in line with the UN framework on immediate socioeconomic impacts of COVID. And we started that last April. And we got responses from about 82 countries. And what we looked for was not just the impacts of COVID on vulnerable groups, but rather the impacts of the policy responses that governments and others were putting in place to respond to COVID. So we asked about policy responses by governments, both national and local. We asked about the gender dimensions of the responses. We asked about unintended consequences uh, we asked about support from non-state actors and vulnerable groups themselves. And we asked about what more could be done to help those uh, vulnerable groups or potentially vulnerable groups. And really by the early summer, we produced a report on the socioeconomic impacts of policy responses to COVID. And we launched that uh, in Geneva with a panel and uh, David Nabarro offered uh, remarks at the beginning, which helped us to, to frame that. Now, now is not the place you can look at the report online, it's on the UNRIS website, it's not the place to go through all of those policy recommendations, but many of them will be familiar to you. The impacts were different in different places, in some uh, it was very much largely about the provision of, of healthcare, in others it was about the dilemma between livelihoods and lives. There were very strong gendered dimensions of the policy responses themselves in addition to the uh, uh, pandemic. But there was also a positive message around innovations and agency, around how business and civil society groups and vulnerable groups themselves were putting in place policy responses that were allowing them to respond in a constructive way. But I think the second thing I want to say is that um, UNRIST for many decades has been working on uh, research and policy advice that I think underpins the sort of response to this crisis that we need and that other panelists uh, have touched on. 
These are long-term, radical, ambitious, structural reforms which put transformation, equity, and inclusion at the heart. We heard from Christina about social protection flaws and systems. And we did see in COVID and also in previous crises that countries that had stronger universal rights-based social protection systems were able to respond to this crisis more quickly because they're not seen as palliative social, uh, safety nets. They're seen as part of the structure of society that protects people throughout their life course. Um, we saw uh, very strongly about the importance of universal comprehensive health systems. And again, countries that had stronger, well-resourced, accessible health systems were able to respond better to COVID. UNRWA's legacy of research on gender and gender justice and on responses to climate are equally important for how we build back uh, forward from this um, crisis. So I think my basic point is um, it's important to do work on the crisis now, but it's important also to recognize a lot of the work that's been put in by academics and by civil society groups in the past on the structural reforms that are needed uh, to build uh, after this crisis. Um, I'll finish there because I do appreciate that we're running out of time, but there was one last thing I want to, to reiterate, and it's really about the politics of change. It's of course, it's important to have policy choices on the table for people to make with their governments uh, about how they're going to respond to this crisis and be stronger in the future. But really change takes more than that. It takes political coalitions for change, which need to be built up over time. They necessarily require the contribution of people, of workers, of governments, of civil society, but also business. And in UNRWA, we, we take a lot of that uh, to heart and we look very carefully at the politics of change and how we can best support progressive coalitions that will eventually make these policies uh, possible. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hi, everyone. Happy Global Social Work Day to all. My name is Shirley Gatanyo Gable, and I am a professor at Fordham University and the co-chair of today's event. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Judith Brown Dianis, who has served as a lawyer, professor, and civil rights advocate in the movement for racial justice. Ms. Dianis is hailed as a voting rights expert and pioneer in the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. She currently serves as executive director of the Advancement Project, Project which combats structural racism in education, voting, policing, criminal justice, and immigration. Judith has launched many significant projects, including authoring the groundbreaking education reports, such as Opportunities Suspended and Derailed, the Schoolhouse to Jailhouse Track, and, um, has, and has also headed the Advancement Project's work with grassroots partners to significantly help decrease student suspensions and arrests in Denver, Baltimore, and school districts throughout Florida. Judith Brown Dianis was awarded the Prime Movers Fellowship for Trailblazing Social Movement Leaders and was named one of the 30 women to watch by Essence Magazine. We have asked Ms. Dianis to join us here today because as we all struggled to get through the pandemic, we also struggled with racial and social injustice across the world, including in the United States. Thank you, uh, Shirley, for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm very excited about being here with you. And when I uh, was listening earlier to uh, Professor Southall, talk about Ubuntu, I was thinking about what a wonderful principle if we all only lived by it. Uh, and thinking about how I am because we are, 
Unfortunately, um, here in the United States, we don't live by that principle. In fact, what we have seen through COVID is the twin pandemics of COVID and racism and an exposed structural racism for the world to see. Unfortunately, structural racism led to disproportionate illness, hospitalization, and death of people of color in this country, harming families and communities. When we look at some of the COVID numbers, it shows the problem. Um, CDC's numbers show that Native Americans were three times more likely than whites to be hospitalized and 2.4 times more likely to die from COVID. For Black people in this country, 2.9% more likely to be hospitalized than whites and 1.9% more likely to die. And for Hispanics, 3.1% more likely to be hospitalized and 2.3% more likely to die. But why did that happen? It happened because our country has these systems of oppression that have led to these outcomes. I think about the own, my own community where I live and looking at some of the data, and we think about why we were more susceptible. It's not because we eat worse, because we don't get out and walk, but it, there are systems that have created these outcomes. And so in my own community in Maryland, I happen to look at some data around our access to healthcare. So yes, there's a problem with access to health insurance, but also when I look at in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is mostly black and Latino, our access to doctors, there are 1,900 people to every one primary care physician. In the county next door, which is predominantly white, Montgomery County, it is 740 people to one primary care physician. So if we don't have access to doctors, we don't have access to hospitals, we can't do preventative care. When we think about the distribution of vaccines now, this is the second step of this, ep of this pandemic and the harm to our community. And we're seeing disproportionate access to the vaccine, which is going to again create the kind of numbers that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. And then if we add to it, where is it? One in five prisoners in state and federal prisons tested positive for COVID-19 in December. We know that in the United States, mass incarceration hits Black and Latinx families and communities harder than other communities. And so that means again, we see the disproportionate outcomes. For Advancement Project, we ended up filing five lawsuits against jails to get people out who were vulnerable to COVID-19. In one of those cases in Miami, one of our clients, Anthony Swain said, the pla this place is a Petri dish for the disease. Because in a jail, you cannot, you cannot socially distance. And in fact, what we were finding in jails is that they didn't have bleach. They didn't have hand sanitizer. They didn't even have soap for people. And so they were left in conditions where the disease could spread. So we had to sue them. Unfortunately, the outcome was not that people got let out. Unfortunately, the outcome was not even in some places that they agreed to giving the kinds of sanitizers and, and um cleaning products that prisoners needed. We had to fight chest for hand sanitizer and soap. And we know that mass incarceration hits our communities harder because the criminal justice system is a system that feeds off of black and brown people in the United States. If we also look at what happened to black and brown children, we sent them home. They thought they were going home for a week but in fact, it was for a year. And too many of them did not have access to, to the internet to continue their education. So they have fallen behind. In the United States, one in three Black, Latino, and Native American households lack high-speed internet at home. They are also nearly twice as likely as white households 
not to have a computer. So here we are in a time where children have to be at home, online, but they can't keep up. And that is because the system was broken before the pandemic. And so I'm gonna wrap up because I know we wanna get into questions, but what I wanna say to you is that it's important for us to know that the pandemic hit us harder in particular communities because the system was broken and inequitable, inequitable beforehand. That in fact, what we have seen is just an exacerbation of the problems that have existed all along since in fact, the founding of this country. And so I would like to say to social workers on this social worker day, that one of the things that I would charge you with is as we fight as lawyers and activists to change the systems, to transform the systems for more equity, to be able to dismantle white supremacy and structural racism in the United States, that you are the bridge to Umbuti. You are the bridge. You are the people who see families sitting in front of you, children sitting in front of you, individuals sitting in front of you. And we know that they are not a case. They're not just case by case, but they show you the symptoms of a broken system. And so the charge for us is to lean into thinking about the bigger picture, to thinking about I am because we are. And what do those people represent who come to you for help? What are they telling you that exposes the larger problems that exist? How can we think about fixing the systems and not just the case of the person who is sitting in front of us? As healthcare workers kind of took to the media and showed us what was happening in the ERs, you are the people who are on the front lines, who know the stories and who can help us turn this around so that we do see the humanity in all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. That was terrific. I'm gonna wait for all our panelists to come on and um, we, as everyone has noted, our time became a little short, so we thought instead we'd have, um, we direct a question to each of our panelists. Um, and then we will ask uh, Anna Maria Campanini to wrap up for us. Um, so Judith, going back to your remarks, um, I, I wanna say thank you because what you're talking about is really at the soul of every social worker who's on today. And I'm sure our uh, United Nations um, representatives as well. And, um, you know, as, as a, there are many students from all over the world who have joined us today. And uh, for students, it's not always that clear what our path is and how we can become active. And so uh, my question to you really is what, what needs to be done now and if you can think of ways that social work, very concrete ways that you know, social workers can help, um, we'd love to hear. Sure, so I, I think there's, there's an opportunity right now um, because so much has been exposed <laughs> that we now can have a conversation that we actually couldn't have had before the pandemic or many of us were already having, but nobody was really listening to us. And so I think that, um, and I'll speak specifically to the United States, we have a new administration at the federal level that actually is embracing the idea of racial equity in the work that they do. And so I think our charge is to both at the federal level and at the state level to be engaged in these conversations about policy because for so many social workers, you're on the front line and you see the things that no one else sees and experiences. So how do we engage with our local legislators, weighing in with them when they're, when they're thinking about doing things in, in policy that are things that we know are wrong? 
how do we engage in, and some of us use social media for this, right? So that's, that's the easiest way to engage, is tell the stories on social media, expose the stories. The other is to weigh in with legislators, to have a collective voice. So if you and, and your and, uh, social workers in a particular place can come together around thinking about the kinds of policy shifts that we need to have to break inequity, then we should be doing that so that we can weigh in with policymakers with the real stories and the real kinds of fixes. But the other thing I just want to mention before I be quiet yeah. is that <laughs> I also want to make sure that we are culturally competent in what we are seeing so that we don't start to be paternalistic because this is the other side that we have to worry about for social workers, especially is to not be paternalistic, but to listen to the people who are in front of you, as we call it, the genius of ordinary people who know the kinds of re resolution that they need to the problems that they are experiencing. So don't always think that you know how to solve it for people, but engage them in a conversation about the right, the right solutions to the problem. Thank you, Judith. You've now convinced me that you're a social worker at heart. <laughs> And, and that's a very big compliment coming from this group. <laughs> um, my next question is, um, I'm, I'm going to ask Christina and Paul if you can each respond to it. Um, there's no question that all of us are very anxious for COVID-19 to be behind us. Um, we know so much about how inequities have been um, exasperated during this time, and it's just been the cause of so much suffering. And yet, scientists are telling us that these types of viruses result from the way we have impacted our natural environment. So our human actions on the natural environment, and that we should expect um, similar new viruses of you know, this kind to appear in the next few years. Um, so my question is, you know, what should we be doing to prepare for this? Um, what can we be doing now? And where do we begin um, to make sure that we protect our most vulnerable populations moving forward? Yeah, th thanks a lot. If I can, if I can start, Shirley, thanks a lot for that, for that question. And I think it's, uh, it's a very important one. Uh, but I think I think we should maybe look beyond beyond future viruses because I think there's also other challenges. I mean, there's climate change, there's um, the um, deep, really rooted inequities that, that Judith has been uh, talking about. And I think so. I think we need to think about these these challenges in a, in a much in a much broader way. And so and as I think maybe maybe going back to what I what I said said previously to um, to build up the social protection systems as, as one part of the response, but also make sure that they are embedded in a broader um, set of policies that are really um, addressing uh, the root causes of of those inequalities that, that we have we have seen. And I think. One of the one of the challenges, um, really, and uh, again, zooming in maybe on on the social protection policies, um, we have seen in in recent years, and as what Judith said, very much resonated uh, with me about about the deep rooted inequalities that we have seen beforehand, and and also the fact that quite often the policies have in a way kind of separated uh, the constituencies. Uh, so I mean, we had the safety nets for the poor. And sometimes we had some kind of some kind of private insurance for those who are who are better off. But what it has it has done, it has really further exacerbated those inequalities. And I think what is about um, the the essence about really building the social protection systems in a way, this is really recognizing that everyone is vulnerable and recognizing that we really need those mechanisms of solidarity. Uh, between different different groups in society, because I, mean, I think I mean this uh, health problems um, and including further viruses, but I think also other kinds of, of challenges, but but also other um, the kind of the daily risks and the um, 
to see of, of daily life. I mean, this happens to all of us. And I think it's important. And I think that, again, um, very much speaks also to the concept of Ubuntu that we have been hearing about. It's, it's really this deep-seated um, solidarity that we need to, to strengthen uh, in, those, in those policies uh, to make sure that we are really in it together. And I think if there was one message also that, that COVID has left it with us, and this that nobody is safe until everyone is safe. So I think it really requires this really kind of in-depth revisiting uh, the policies, um, the social and economic policies that we have and really think about how can we build them, how can we use them to reinvigorate the social contract. And I think this um, is certainly one thing that will help us about future viruses, but also about the many other challenges that we're going to face in the, in the future. Thank you, Christina. Um, Paul? Uh so we're short of time. So let, let me just say all of that plus, because I'd have said <laughs> some of that. Um, you know, you can't join a seminar these days without people talking about the need to reinvigorate um, the social contract. And I think uh, the work that we do in UNRIST is very much in support of that. But you need to, I think you need to quite radically revisit what that social contract means and how it's built and what it covers both socially and environmentally. I mean, the short answer to your question on, on preventing future zoonotic diseases is we need to reset our relationship with nature, but we are going to have shocks that we don't create also coming to us in the future. And fundamentally we need to address inequalities and not just those which have grown exponentially in the last 40 years associated with income and wealth, but all the horizontal class-based, race-based, misogynistic-based inequalities that underpin our societies. And, and last year, when we started talking about this, I think it needs a fundamental revisitation of fiscal policy, because our current uh, fiscal policy systems across the world are, are biased towards the rich and uh, you know, are against those who are potentially vulnerable or in difficult positions. And I think unless we get to the bottom of that, then we're not going to make our system stronger and more equitable for the shops that we're going to face in the future. And in short, we don't just need a new social contract that's more inclusive. We need an eco-social contract that advances our societies and our well-being, but within the natural boundaries of the planet, which is why that we've been calling for a, a new eco-social contract, which is context-driven from the bottom up, involving people, and renegotiations with business and governments about how we live in this finite planet, but how also we can advance our possibilities for the future. Well, could you just say a few more words about that, the eco-social contract? Because I think that's something that would be of great interest to social workers and might, they might want to be involved in that. Um, yeah, and I spoke about it at an event with the University of Edinburgh and uh, Johannesburg and uh, the Rajagiri School of Social Work in Kerala this morning, but very, very briefly, because I don't want to take up too much time, but you, our social contracts, and there are many around the world, are no longer fit for purpose. They're not inclusive enough. We live in a completely different changed environment with globalization, with more diverse communities communities where the sexual contract has changed between men and women. I mean, if you look at post-World War II social contracts in Europe, they were based around men's role in the workplace, and that has fundamentally changed. So we need to have a more inclusive rights-based social contract that recognizes the contributions that people can make. Secondly, we need one that is eco-conscious, and eco not an economic, but eco as an ecological. And we can't go on using up the resources from so many planets and then expect not to create problems like zoonotic diseases that cross and then uh, you know, ravage our lives and the lives of millions of people around, around for years. And to underpin that, we need a new fiscal contract. And that is why we need to look at the equity of how we tax and spend for inclusive uh, societies. Okay. 
Thank you, Paul. That's, that's interesting. And it's going to lead us into the question that we have for Laurel. But I just wanted to make a note for everyone, because uh, there have been a number of questions on the chat or in the Q&A. And I know people are looking for resources. They're looking for bios of the speakers. Um, they're looking to see if this will be recorded. We are recording the recording resources, bios, other information that speakers have mentioned will be available on our Social Work Day at the UN website. Um, and I've put that uh, link into the Q&A, so most of you can see that. But uh, if you just have to Google Social Work Day at the UN, you will also find that website. So, Laurel, we're going to pick up this thread a little bit uh, in this discussion around COVID in the future, because you mentioned um, in your presentation hyperlocal analytics and micro-tailored approaches that leave no one behind. So what are the capabilities we need? to be able to navigate COVID and to look for a future that, that we want. Robin, thank you. And I think I can pick up a couple of what Paul, Christina and Judith have already brought into this space. So from our perspective, one of the things that we find is that as we, as we think about what does action look like in this space, not towards fixing what's broken or tinkering along the edges and so on, but really radically reimagining, that's a different set of capabilities that we need to, to bring in. And what we've been thinking a lot about is bridging the gap, as I said, between an espoused belief as an individual and collective actions, asking ourselves a question, why do we collectively produce results that nobody wants? We, we don't want this. And yet here we are, we're, there's, a, there's a gap that we're missing Judith, Paul, Christine, you've all spoken to it in different ways. I would put three things on the table from the work that we're doing at UNDP, and maybe we can put into the chat um, a space which we've created on transformation, uh, which is accessible to everybody here, and you can learn more. This is a collaboration with MIT Presencing Institute and, and Otto Schormer. Three things that are really critical in terms of capability. One is around decision making, and here, it's a skill set and a capability set in generative listening. We tend to hear back what we want. Uh, we get that reverberated in social media. We tend in the in the in the friends and social networks around us. We we tend to hear, hear back in these echo chambers. So how can we develop skills of generative listening where we're creating spaces with our colleagues? And I think as social workers, you are at the forefront of leading in this space. We, it's something that needs to be extended quite dramatically. So it's about generative listening and how that can lead to different choices and decisions. Number two is around stakeholder relations. And here we're doing a lot of work with indigenous peoples and asking the question, how do we understand the system as it is experienced at the margins? And I think Judith was talking a lot about this earlier as well too. So the experience of systems from the middle, the experience of systems from those that have predominantly held power is very different from those at the margins. We held a discussion with colleagues and it was brought to the group, something I wasn't aware that indigenous peoples did not have a voice or access to the United Nations until 1977. It just wasn't recognized. So even for ourselves, how do we understand systems and the way they're experienced from the margin and bring that into the center of the way that we're driving policies and choices? The third is around leadership. And this isn't leadership understood in its silos. This is leadership understood as every single person that's on this call. This is leadership understood as empowerment and empowering networks for action. And here are the key skills is how can we use these generative listening skills, how we can we create spaces for much healthier, much more diverse stakeholder conversations so that we start to sense what's emerging and actualize the future today. One of the challenges with things like 2030 Agenda is we always think there's more time. We always think it's, and then when we get to 2030, maybe we have our next plan to 2050. And so we keep going. One of the things we need to do is use awareness-based transformative practices and capabilities so that we start recognizing that the change is ourselves and it's today, here and now. There's no one else and there's no where else and there's no other time than now for these things. So if I can maybe just, just leave with that, that's a, um, I hope something that's you know useful to the group here and certainly important for us in the way we're working in the UN system. Thank you, Laurel. That, that's terrific and, uh, and a lot to think about. <laughs> um, 
And we've asked uh, Dr. Anna Maria Campanini to wrap this up for us and, and give us a quick summary. Um, many of you know who uh, Dr. Anna Maria Campanini, uh, she is a professor of social work at the Milano Bicocca University. And she is also the president of the International Association of the Schools of Social Work. She was the previous president of the European Association Schools of Social Work, and she has taught and, um, uh, and written in many languages. <laughs> um, around, she's taught around the world and written in many different, I think it's uh, English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Yeah. <laughs> so we figure that's good training for wrapping up today's session, so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Maria. It has been a wonderful uh, uh, panel, and um, I appreciate uh, all the discussion that has been um, uh, created. Not easy to wrap up, but um, I will try to keep some suggestions, starting from um, Vishanti. Um, she said that people are uh, looking more um, about uh, uh, the, to measure uh, the, the value that they measure and not measure what they value. And also that uh, we have to focus uh, uh, on egalitarianism through humanism and not uh, on GDP. And this takes me back to what I have read about uh, Edgar Morin, who was a, a French philosopher, uh, was uh, speaking about a new civilization uh, in which uh, this uh, aspect uh, of the, of the um, economic uh, and market and also the status symbol has to be overcome. And from Lauren, the uh, SDGs integration that also uh, bring me back to the um, discussion of uh, Friti of Krapra about uh, using a systemic approach uh, in uh, working uh, with uh, these uh, different uh, GDP uh, SDGs. And uh, uh, this also uh, is connected in my idea with the eco-social approach in social work, uh, where we can uh, see the, the level of intervention with the um, individual family, not uh, as the opposite uh, to the macro uh, level, but uh, uh, looking at this uh, micro problem as also, I think uh, that um, uh, Judith perhaps uh, said uh, in the last uh, speech, uh, listening the story of, the, of each person, we can uh, go uh, and uh, analyze the common problems and the work uh, towards a macro practice, a structural change. And um, then uh, once again, uh, uh, Laurel spoke about uh, not linear solution, but a developing solution from the bottom. And uh, this is also something that is very much connected with uh, our uh, perspective of uh, having uh, at the center the, the, the people, the, the capacity that they have. Uh, so involve them in uh, empowering them in finding their own solution. So solution that comes from the bottom, solution that can involve the community and also the community who are in the border, not at the center now, as also, um, I don't remember who was, uh, Laurel, I think, or, or Chrissy. Uh, said um, so the more marginalized uh, uh, people that have to be um, in the center in the front. So uh, from Christine, um, the importance of a, a universal social protection system that should be centered on the human being. And uh, this is also another important aspect. Uh, our intervention should be always a center uh, on the on the human um, experience, and um, from the Paul Lad, I will uh, keep uh, the idea of research, research uh, that of course they are uh, organizing in a very wide uh, way, but um, that I think should be part of the competencies of the social work. There 
it was uh, 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 in the past uh, thought as uh, one of the methods of the social work, uh, research that uh, can help us uh, to look at the, the um, situation in which uh, we are involved uh, with a perspective uh, to connect the different situation and to find the commonalities. So we can, I go back to the uh, level between micro and macro. And so we can uh, uh, work um, in a way that um, from, <clears throat> from research, we can collect information that can be uh, used as a support for a, a new kind of uh, uh, policy. And um, I also think that um, we can, um, we can uh, um, develop uh, a, a more uh, um, a more advanced uh, uh, policy practice, uh, policy practice to um, try to uh, change the, the, the situation. Uh, because we are at the forefront uh, and so we can uh, um, see and uh, understand uh, what are the needs of the population and together with them uh, we can uh, use, for example, uh, uh, social advocacy uh, activity uh, or uh, more uh, political engagement in relation to the level in which we are involved. And, uh, of course, uh, um, there is... Uh, um, uh, another aspect that has been uh, underlined uh, by Judith, uh, the racial justice and uh, the, the twin pandemic. I think that this has been uh, also an interesting aspect uh, that uh, we, we can see that COVID has also um, made more evident the system of oppression, you know, and the, the data she, the she brought was uh, were really absolutely, uh, absolutely clear. And <clears throat> I think that uh, the um, uh, the way in which we we can work, uh, uh, trying also to summarize uh, uh, different aspects that has been uh, presented by the, the panelists. Uh, is uh, not to use uh, an instructive way um, with uh, our uh, uh, can, uh, people who are uh, using the services or are asking some help, but uh, a more co-evolutive way in which uh, we uh, together with them uh, can be individual, can be groups, can be a community. We try to find uh, the, the way to overcome uh, the difficulties uh, that uh, um, the, the situation that the people in the situation are facing. And uh, I would like just to finish uh, to recall uh, the words of Jane Adams who in the uh, 1930s, uh, she said that the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain, is floating in midair until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. And I think that uh, this is really something that is in connection with the idea of Ubuntu. Uh, I am because we are. And uh, also underline uh, the, the value of social work that are uh, uh, really based uh, on this uh, um, idea since the beginning uh, of our profession and our discipline. So I really uh, hope that uh, uh, we will um, uh, focus during uh, this, uh, this year, because we know that uh, this is the first pillar <clears throat> for the global agenda of 2020-2030, which is very close also and um, coherent with uh, SDGs. Um, I hope that we um, commit ourselves to co-construct this uh, social transformation, not from above, but through the involvement of the communities and all of who are interested. So we, we go back also to the Paul Led, uh, who said uh, a political coalition for change that have to involve the many different kind of um, agents, we can say. 
And uh, uh, we have to work in the direction uh, of uh, sustainability, equity, social justice, and um, the, the work that uh, we have tried also as association of schools of social work to develop through the um, uh, support of Lena Dominelli, uh, which um, has been one of the leader in the green social work to take in consideration not only the, the social environment, uh, which has been always uh, our, uh, um, our characteristic, but also the natural environment in our intervention, both at individual level or community level, I think is very important. And uh, we must uh, use our competencies and the competencies of the people who use the services and together uh, we have to, uh, to push and to urge the uh, responsibility of the institution and the state to protect the citizen, to give answers that are sufficient and adequate for all the diverse need. And I really hope that uh, this, uh, this day will help us uh, to uh, reflect and uh, can become an important incentive in our daily commitment as a teacher, as a researcher, as a student, as a professional. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Happy Social Work Day from us to all of you. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>